الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الحمد وله الملك يحيي ويميت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله وصفيه وخليله أرسله الله للناس نذيرا وبشيرا من يطع الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فقد هدى فقد فقد هدي إلى صراط مستقيم ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فقد ضل ضلالا بعيدا أوصيكم ونفسي أولا بتقوى الله وطاعته وأحذركم من عسيانه ومخالفة أمره أما بعد فإن خير الحديث كتاب الله وأحسن الهدي هدي محمد وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول الله عز وجل وهو أصدق القائلين في كتابه الكريم لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي فمن يكفر بالطاغوت ويؤمن بالله فقد استمسك بالعروة الوثقى لا انفصام لها والله سميع عليم الله ولي الذين آمنوا يخرجهم من الظلمات إلى النور والذين كفروا أولياؤهم الطاغوت يخرجونهم من من النور إلى الظلمات أولئك أصحاب النار هم فيها خالدون Brothers and sisters committed Muslims I want to talk to you today about why we have enemies but I don't want to take a reactive approach to the issue meaning that we wait for our enemies to do something and that somehow defines the domain of activities that we engage in I want to take a little bit of a different approach being aware of these ayat that were just quoted and they happen to be ayat 256 and 257 from Surah Al-Baqarah and these ayat have been quoted so often 
that I think that given that our time is limited, it doesn't behoove me at this point to engage in a long translation of these ayat. But suffice it to say that as this talk goes on, that you will be made aware of the meaning of these ayat. Often is the case that when committed Muslims stand up and stand against societal injustice or global oppression, their detractors, mainly being other Muslims, say in voices that are just as loud that what are you doing? Why do you continue to talk about what your enemy is doing? You ought to focus on being proactive and doing the things that in a sense your enemy is paid to do. Your enemy is expected to do the things that he's doing and so you ought to be more proactive, more engaged in what your own social, political and economic program ought to be. However, this particular position that often puts Muslim activists ill at ease departs from the very meaning of the ayah that was just quoted. And whoever rejects the unbridled power of states, the coercive power of governments, and then commits to Allah, he will have latched on to an unfailing support that will never give way. And so what the ayah is saying, that in order to have Iman, the first thing that you have to do is to reject the Taghut. Or a precondition to Iman is the rejection of the Taghut. And this word Taghut is another one of those Islamic and Quranic words that has fallen into disfavor. Whose meanings have been diluted by translations. And so if you look around at many of the translations of this word, they will say that it is related to oppressive kings. But we don't have kings in the world that we live in today, for the most part. What we do have are nation states and governments and certain private enterprise that use their power to coerce other people rather than persuasively convincing them on a certain course of action. So in a sense, it could be said that were it not for the rejection of the Taghut, there would be no such thing as Iman. Or in other words, it is Iman that is rejecting the Taghut. For are we not familiar with the story of Ibrahim? When he took his Iman to the public forum and confronted the Taghut of his day, some call him Nimrod or Nimrud. And he had a public debate with this Taghut about the power of Allah versus the temporal power of human beings. And so Iman is a byproduct of the public and the vocal engagement of the Taghut. For if we say that Iman is conviction that has settled into the heart, 
that started with a commitment, an intellectual commitment. What turned that commitment into conviction is the challenge to that Iman that was issued by the Taghut. And when you are forced to justify your commitment in a public engagement with those who would challenge it, that is what forces commitment into conviction. And if we have to handle our business on earth, we better have more conviction than we have commitment. And so here with is the reason why we have enemies. Allah Ta'ala in His divine wisdom laid out the entire earth and for that matter the universe for His conforming subjects. And when we say that the entire earth has been laid out for Allah's conforming subjects. What we mean is that Allah Ta'ala has put man on earth with a certain mission and a certain responsibility. And if that responsibility is weighty enough that we as human beings are given the designation of Allah's deputy on earth. That means that in order to manage that responsibility, we have to have some idea of what our capabilities are as human beings. And were we not to engage the enemy or the taghut, we would have very little idea of what we are capable of or what heights we are capable of ascending to. And so what this means is that it immediately puts the taghut in a secondary position. The primary position on earth belongs to Allah's conforming subjects. But you may look around the world and say that you have it all backwards. That those who are committed to doing evil, those who oppress, those whose, those whose program is one of injustice, they're the ones who dominate. We're Allah's conforming subjects. How can you say that we are in a primary position and they are in a secondary position? But if we had our confidence about us, and if we were self-aware, we would see any situation in which we and our enemies coexist as one in which our enemies service our needs. And once again, you might ask, how are our enemies servicing our needs? It looks like we're in the servant position. However, again, if you look at this dynamic in a proactive way, were it not for your enemy challenging you, you would have no idea of what your capabilities are. You would have no idea of what you as a human being can bear in the pursuit of your decent and honorable objectives. For isn't it Allah Himself who said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفٌ مِّنَ الشَّيْطَانِ تَذَكَّرُوا فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ As for those who guard themselves against Allah's corrective justice, those who have taqwa, when they are lightly brushed by shaitan, they step back and they reflect. And this is how they gain insight and foresight. And so when you engage with the enemy in a public forum, and when you stand up to the taghut in a public domain, 
Meaning that other people have the chance to see that you could be oppressed and that you could be humiliated in such a situation, but nonetheless you stand out against that injustice. It is through that process that you gain insight and foresight. It is that process that causes you to be more creative. And if you were to ask any society's intellectuals, what is your greatest resource? They would tell you that it is our internal creativity. It doesn't matter what's in the ground. It doesn't matter what fossil fuel resources you have, or what mineral resources you have, or how much money you have, or how much wealth you have. All of that is a byproduct of your internal human creativity. And if you can figure out a way to unleash and unshackle that creativity, you have all the wealth and all the resources that you need. In order to ground these ayat a little bit further, وَمَن يَكْفُرْ بِالطَّاغُوتِ وَيُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ إِسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوُثْقَى لَنْفِصَامَ لَهَا وَاللَّهُ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ In order to ground these ayat in our hearts and minds a little bit better, let us consider a sports analogy. In a league of teams, there are always the teams that perform really well and there are always the teams that perform really badly. And so all leagues have the good teams and the bad teams. And the good teams always get better even when they play the bad teams. For when a good team plays a bad team, the bad team wants to prove itself by beating the good team. It can claim that I beat the best. And thus, it always brings its so-called A game. It brings its best effort when it's playing the good team. It doesn't bring that kind of effort when it's playing another bad team. But it always brings its best effort when it's playing the best team. And so in this dynamic, the good team always receives the best effort of the lesser teams. And thereby the good team continues to get better. Because it's always receiving the highest level of competition. And so what you tend to observe is that regardless of the team that the good team is playing against, the good team is always getting better. And we see this dynamic work itself out in front of us almost every day. And it doesn't matter what kind of sport you pay attention to, it doesn't matter whether you pay attention to teams in the economic domain, in the political domain where parties fight it out with each other. Wherever you have a collection of teams that are competing for a certain objective, you see this dynamic in play. And yet given the prolific nature of this dynamic, we Muslims are still afraid to engage the Taghut in a public forum. We are afraid to ascend to the level that we need to in order to engage intellectually, proactively, politically, at a certain level. Continuing this analogy a little bit further, when you get to the championship and two teams are vying against each other to be the ultimate winner, winner, at that top level, The game is less about the physical talents of each team because the physical talents tend to be on par with each other. One team basically has the same physical talent that the other team has. 
And so they will tell you at the championship level, all those who have been there, that winning is a state of mind. The team with the mental edge generally always wins. The team that executes better. The team that has a smarter strategy. The team that has better situational awareness. The team that doesn't get frustrated with the ups and downs of the game. The team that keeps its head about itself in critical moments of the game. That's the team that generally ends up winning. And in certain instances at a championship level, one of the teams that is competing for the ultimate prize tends to be favored by leaps and bounds over its competitor. And in that situation, and here's where I want you to pay attention, in that situation, when you go to the lesser team competing for a championship, and you say you're completely outclassed, that team has better talent than you, they're younger than you, they're hungrier than you. What are you going to do to win? You have no chance. And in this particular instance, you will hear the leaders of the lesser team tell you it's not about them, it's about us. And so they're telling you that if we do our business properly, if we execute properly, if we have a strategy that neutralizes their strengths, then we can win despite the odds. Regardless of what the odds makers say, if we're smarter, if we're more committed to a strategy that works, we're going to win. And that happens to be the case in reality. When they say that winning is a state of mind, if you believe that you can win, if you're confident that you can win, then you can go out there and do something creative and innovative to make you win. And in the sports world, they call that kind of a victory a miracle. But in fact, it's, it's not really a miracle. It's really about preparation and the belief that you can overcome, regardless of what the worldly odds are. And so now let's go back to how certain Muslim activists are criticized by their own brothers when they say, what are you doing? What are you doing has a context. It's about us has a context. When you say it's about us, it's about what you're doing, it's about what we're doing, that's within the domain of you recognizing who your enemy is who your opponent is, who your competitor is, what he's doing, what makes him a winner, what makes him overcome. And if you say it outside of that context, what are you doing? And you have no recognition of what the enemy is, who the enemy is, what his characteristics are. Then that statement has no meaning. It ought to have no meaning to you, and it had to, ought to have no meaning to the questioner. And so now that we're talking about the enemy, the Tawut, what his characteristics are, what he behaves like, let's not make it something theoretical. Let's talk about what the characteristics of the Tawut are. We have Tawut today and we have Tawut in the past. And what binds them is a common behavior. The way that they behaved in the past and the way that they behave today is exactly the same. And we could enumerate a large number of characteristics of the Tawut, but two of the ones that rise to the top are the following. First, they have no appreciation 
for the human lives of the other, the so-called other, whoever they define to be the other, whoever they define to be the other, they have no respect for the lives of those human beings. Whether they live or die, it doesn't matter to them. The second characteristic, again, that rises to the top of the many characteristics of the Tawut, is that they retain no fidelity to the agreements that they enter into. In a word, they lie. They cheat. Okay, so let's, again, not leave this at a theoretical level. Let's give some examples of what we're talking about. Let's look at Africa, for instance. Not any particular country, but just in the continent in general. Just looking at the continent in general. There are people, wealthy people on earth, that are supported by their governments, that will spend perhaps tens of millions of dollars to preserve the habitat of the elephant or some other endangered species. And literally they will spend tens of billions of dollars so that they can go and see this animal in its natural habitat. And yet the same people will not spend a, a penny for the human beings that are basically living right next to these endangered species. The animals are considered to be endangered, but the human beings are considered to be expendable. And again, I'm describing a characteristic of the Tawud, that the so-called lives of the other don't matter. Almost as if they don't exist. Going a little bit further, you will discover that the vast majority of diamond mines and gold mines and silver mines and the mines for other precious minerals and metals, that those mines exist in areas where tribal warfare or warfare between countries is taking place. And in a sense, what I mean, not in a sense, in reality, what happens is that these people have to sell their precious resources in order to buy weapons to prosecute this warfare. And if you're mining for diamonds or you're mining for gold, you have to use water, which is under a very high pressure jet stream to break up the stone. And you know that when you have water under very high pressure and you're shooting it at rock, that you are perhaps using millions upon millions of gallons of water in order, in a, in order to mine for diamonds or for gold. And if you're using millions of gallons of water, that means you must have access to either the groundwater or some other source of water. And yet not two or three miles away from these mines, you have people who are starving for water. You are using this water for the purpose of profit, but you are not using this water to feed the thirsty people who are not more than two or three miles away from these mines. Which means that you have no value for this life. You have no value for this human life, the so-called other. For you, Africa would just be a big zoo. For you don't care about the people. You don't care about their livelihood. You don't care about their health. You don't care about their well-being. You don't care about bringing their standard of living up to your standard of living. But at the same time, you want all their resources. And you engage them in, in, in internecine warfare in order to get at those resources. And by the way, in places where you do have these mines, 
Just by coincidence, you also had the Ebola virus. Why is it that in areas you, where you have vast resources that serve as empire on the outside that you have the Ebola virus? Now almost all of those who've looked, in, looked into this matter, they know that the Ebola virus is a manufactured virus. It comes as a byproduct of genetically engineered mosquitoes. Now this, this news and information doesn't get around because ultimately it might go to the source. And some people might try to hold that source accountable. And so it just gets lost. And generally it gets lost because the vast majority of Muslims who ought to be paying attention to these kinds of things, they're away without leave. Look at Afghanistan. The same people wanted to spend perhaps tens of millions of dollars to preserve the ancient Buddhist statues. And yet the Afghan people themselves, at the time that they wanted to spend all this money to preserve these statues, they had endured something like 25 years of war. It was already a poor country to begin with. No health care. No economic progress of any kind, no schooling. And yet, instead of servicing these needs of the people, you want to spend 30 or 40 million dollars and preserve a bunch of statues. You're saying it's, it's, it's part of the common human historical heritage. Well, what about the people? That's part of the common global heritage in the time that you live in. Why not take care of them and then they might take care of the statues? Once again, you have no regard for the lives of the other. In Syria, and I don't know if you heard this, but I'll remind you of it. One of these Takfiri scholars from Arabia, this was right around the inception of the imposed war on that country. He came out with uh, an Islamic legal opinion. And I, I hate to use the word fatwa for it because it's very idiotic. But nonetheless, he came out with an Islamic legal opinion. And he said that it's okay to kill two-thirds of the Syrian population to save one-third. Yeah, he said it's halal to kill two-thirds are, do you know how many, two, how much two thirds is of twenty six million people? It's something like eight and a half, it's something like sixteen million people. He's saying it's, it's okay to kill sixteen million people to 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 save eight million. Once again, there is no respect for the life of the so called other. In Islamic Iran, this information hasn't gone public yet, but I'm sure that you're going to see it very soon. Some people here in the military and sort of administrative brain trust of the current administration, they approached what they thought were some nationalistic as opposed to Islamic elements in Islamic Iran's military some high-level officers. They held a meeting with them, not inside of Iran, but somewhere in Europe or the United States, maybe Canada. Held a meeting with them and they said that if you just get rid of this wilayat the faqih thing, if you overthrow the current elected Islamic government, then we will support you and publicly you can maintain your anti-imperial and anti-Israeli status. But behind the scenes, we want you to take over the government and rule as a military government. And once again, they said publicly, you know, we will not acknowledge that we had anything to do with the coup. And at the same time, you can continue to condemn us. 
you can continue to employ the same anti-imperialist, anti-Zionist rhetoric. And we will, in a sense, run interference for you and allow you to, uh, to be the rulers of that country. And they said, if you don't agree to these terms, then we are going to engage in a massive aerial, naval, and ground campaign against you. In which we estimate, conservatively, that you are going to lose three to four million people. Three to four million civilians are going to die if we engage in this massive aerial and naval campaign against you. And then they said, do you want that on your conscience? The killer is asking the victim, do you want that on your conscience? Which suggests that the killer has no conscience. For him, three to four million is just a number. He doesn't care that these people have brothers and sisters and daughters and sons and grandparents and, and, what, and what have you. He doesn't care that they have lives. He doesn't care that they have loved ones. All that doesn't matter to him. The second characteristic that we said is that they have no fidelity to agreements that they themselves enter into. Of course, the one that's in the news right now is the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, was entered, duly entered into by the group of Taghut in the world against sort of uh, uh, what, you, what they might characterize as a pipsqueak upholder of justice in the world. Okay, what's the point of saying all of this? Well, the reason that all of this is being said is that in the coming years and decades, there's going to be a larger number of ostensibly Islamic leaders that are going to be taking over the reins of leadership and the reins of decision-making in their majority Muslim countries. But the vast majority of them are not going to be cognizant of what this ayah wants them to notice. They are going to be on a program of correcting the so-called internal problems in a sense to become strong internally and then when you are at a certain level of power then you begin to engage at a more global level but what these ayat are saying that if you want to engage in an Islamic program of reconstruction you are not going to be successful until you are cognizant of what your enemy is doing. Until you can identify your enemy, you can figure out what strategies he's employing. Not that you have to counter his particular strategies, but you have to engage him in a way, in a public manner, that turns your commitments into convictions. For if you don't engage that enemy in a public manner and allow him to challenge you, then whatever commitments that you have will remain intellectual and they will not turn into convictions. And if you have to fight your enemy on a battlefield, you better have conviction. For it is conviction that gives you the fortitude to see that through. It is conviction that gives you the fortitude to tolerate torture. It is conviction that gives you the fortitude to tolerate a rain of bombs and missiles. And so this means that the rejection of the Taghut is not something theoretical or emotional. It is something that is intensely practical. 
We reject their politics. We reject the ideological infrastructure that gave them power. Meaning that we cannot afford to employ the same ideological power, the same ideological framework to acquire power in the world. We have our own means. And everything that we do ought to come organically out of Allah's words, His guidance, the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And what it also means is that you don't reach a level of accommodation with the Taghut. You don't reach a level of acceptability of institutions and programs and systems of those who have overweening coercive power in the world. Of those who have maximalist power in the world. Of those who can try to force you to do something at the, at the end of the barrel of a gun. And unfortunately, over the last 10 to 12 years, some of our brothers in fact did make these mistakes. They made these mistakes in Egypt, in Tunisia. And our brothers in Hamas are now currently making these same mistakes. وَمَن يَكْفُرْ بِالطَّاغُوتِ وَيُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ اسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوَثْقَى لَنْفِصَامَ لَهَا وَاللَّهُ سَمِيرٌ عَلِيمٌ أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ فَاسْتَغْفِرُوهُ يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ فَاسْتُرْشِدُوهُ يُرْشِدْكُمْ Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Speaking of the Taghut, at least in this forum we cannot afford to let up on the pressure on that illegitimate kingdom in Arabia. And as we spent a good part of this talk in talking about the characteristics of the Taghut, that Taghuti kingdom, just yesterday, launched a missile at a busload of children in a school bus. The school bus happened to be going by a crowded marketplace. Most of the dead they say they said yesterday it was 50 dead and 77 injured. Most of the dead were less than 10 years old. And it's said that the death toll is expected to climb because in that particular province of Yemen there are very few hospitals if any. And because of the blockade by that illegitimate Saudi monstrosity No medicines can get in to that province in Yemen. And so when a spokesman of that decrepit kingdom, when this information was brought to one of these Saudi officials, uh, his name is uh, Colonel Turki al-Maliki. So when he was told about this massacre, basically that took place, all these school children slaughtered, instead of contrition, he was defiant. He came out and said that this was a, a legitimate military operation that is conversant with international humanitarian law. He said it was a legitimate military operation that is sustained by international humanitarian law. Either he's a nutcase or he's a taghut or both.
And as I said, that when it comes to the human lives of the so-called other, there's no contrition, there's no feeling. To them, these people are not human beings. They're not one of Allah's finest creation. To them, it's just numbers. Here today, gone tomorrow, it doesn't matter. In another incident talking about the Tawhut, there's a feud going on between two NATO countries, the United States and Turkey. The United States, in order to drive up pressure on Turkey, increased its tariffs on steel and aluminum to 20% and 50%. It doubled them from 10% and 25% to 20% and 50% on aluminum and steel respectively. And it's saying that it's driving up this pressure, uh, mind you, on another NATO country. Turkey is a NATO country. And if something like this happens to a NATO member, then all other NATO members are expected to come in and support the oppressed NATO member. That's what belonging to NATO is supposed to mean. But again, if you're a sort of a Muslim member of NATO, then there's special rules that apply to you. All the rules that apply to all the other members don't really apply to you. So, uh, so the administration here in the White House is saying that uh, we have to ratchet up this pressure because uh, the government over there in Turkey, uh, they illegally put an American pastor behind bars accusing him of participation in the coup attempt that took place in 2016. And in coming out in support of this pastor, the, the US President, Mr. Trump, he said that I'm, a, I'm more of a spy than he is in order to try to vindicate this person. That I'm more of a spy than he is. And so we ask Mr. Trump, that you have a Muslim woman in Texas who's been tortured on shoddy evidence, meaning that her, her case is a slam dunk or an open and shut case. She wasn't guilty of anything. Who's been in prison, who was accused of terrorism, who was tortured, who's lost the service of some of her organs, who's now been in prison after being sort of illegally and immorally convicted, who's now been in prison for over 10 years. And so we ask you, Mr. Trump, that do you have the courage to take a look at this case and say that I am more of a terrorist than she is? You're the president, you're the most so-called powerful man in the world. But that's the difference between Christians and Muslims. Christians, regardless of what they do, and I don't know if this pastor is guilty. But according to this administration, Christians, regardless of what they do, are innocent, they're angels. And Muslims, regardless of what they do, are born guilty. They're guilty before prove, being proven innocent. And don't think that just because somebody belongs to the church, that he couldn't be engaging in spying activities. There's a case, not too long ago, it just came to light. The case of a person by the name of K. K. Hirami, and he was the CEO of the Humanitarian International Services Group. It's basically an evangelical missionary non-governmental organization, NGO, 
that was assigned the task of penetrating into Korea, North Korea. And this happened during the George W. Bush administration. And the multi-million dollar funds for this organization was authorized by the Department of Defense. So here you have evangelicals, you have spies, U.S. spies, whose cover is an evangelical Christian NGO. So don't think that just because you belong to the church or you have, you're a person of the cloth, that you can't be engaging in spying activities. So let's not automatically dismiss the charges that the Turkish government has leveled against this pastor. Because in this country there has been a history of employing these people to work in NGOs, to work as medical professionals and, and what have you. And yet claim to the rest of the world that, that we are innocent. Look, he's just, you know, a person of the cloth. Don't be fooled. Because when you're talking about the Tawhut, there are no morals. There are no standards of justice. It's whatever drives your national interest or personal interest forward. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan wa rizuqna al-tiba'a. Wa arina al-baatila baatilan wa rizuqna al-jtinaaba. Allahumma aghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat. Al-ahyai minhum wal amwat. Innaka qareebun sami'un majeebu da'awat. Allahumma rabbana atina fi al-dunya hasana. Wa fi al-akhirati hasana. Wa qina a'adhab al-nar. ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ حديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب عباد الله إن الله يأمر عباد الله إن الله إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر فيها اسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله